Good morning and welcome to Grace Church. It is good to be with you. It is good to be together here and online. Just a couple of comments. I try not to change things every week. And uh, we are approaching success at that goal. Um, But a couple of items about communion. As you may know, we're continuing to not receive wine. However, we will be coming around with the chalice. There are a lot of us who would like to reverence the chalice, perhaps touch it or interact with the chalice in some way without drinking the wine. And so when you come up for communion, keep your mask on, receive your bread, do what you like with the chalice, except don't drink the wine, and then return to your seat to consume the bread. If you just receive bread, that is sufficient for communion. So it is good to be with you. We have a couple of announcements right at the end just to prepare you for that. And otherwise, it is Sunday at Grace Church. Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to be God forever and ever.
The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. you. Let us pray. Offensive God, refusing our religion of sacrifice and power, find us in your wandering. Speak to us the word of life. Liberate our violent hearts. And let us stay with you. Through Jesus Christ, the Holy One of God, Amen. A reading from Joshua. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all people, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Now therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river of the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along all the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Please stand and we'll read the psalm together. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his, and his ears, ears are, are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to root out the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears them, and delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and will save those whose spirits are crushed. Many are the troubles of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver him out of them all. He will keep safe all his bones. Not one of them shall be broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. The Lord ransoms the life of his servants, and none will be punished who trust in him. A reading from Ephesians. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore, 
and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you, there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Here's something fun that we could do. Let's list the things we don't like about Christianity. 
I'll go first. <laughs> I don't like how elusive and indirect and mystifying Christianity is right at the very center. Our Savior dies and rises again. Yes, I believe this, and I proclaim Alleluia year by year when we preach this good news to one another and to the world. But I have so many questions. He could eat in their presence, but also move through walls. He invited Thomas to touch him, but he told Mary Magdalene not to touch him. And then Thomas ended up not touching him. Or did he touch him after all? The text doesn't say. Come on now. <laughs> then there's the Nicene Creed. It is splendid, replete with the discerned wisdom of early 4th century spiritual teachers a masterpiece of systematic theology, a crash course in Christology, a true and effective song of praise to the Holy Trinity. And it is as elusive as the risen Christ himself. What does it mean? How does it all really work? And when we say it, are we saying we believe in God the way we believe in, say, gravity? As in, this we believe, this right here, because we think it's true? Or are we saying we believe the words of the Nicene Creed as in, we trust them, we live into them, or we sing or dance with them? Which is it? And what does it really mean to sing or dance with a text? Then there are the ever more serious problems with Christianity, the way it can so easily be used and abused, the way that a gospel about self-giving love can so easily become a tool of oppression and even genocide. Generations after something is written down, like John's gospel, for instance, Christians foolishly and wickedly twist the text to rationalize dreadful things like anti-Jewish violence and murder. We can all too easily misunderstand Paul's letters and not see his proto-feminism, but rather see its opposite and justify the oppression of women, of all things, creating Christian communities that put women down. Paul would be mortified by this. He praised women by name as equal leaders and church founders, something that was scarcely ever done in his place and time. It is just so easy to misinterpret Christianity and Christ himself. I suppose that's true for any religious tradition that endures long enough on the face of this old, tired earth. And speaking of the earth, there's the maddening way that some Christians can bizarrely see our faith as Gnostic escapism, a world-denying promise about the afterlife. And so these Christians sing old hymns with terrible verses like, Earth is a desert drear, heaven is my home. Come on now. That is not what Jesus taught. That's not what God has ever taught. God who lovingly made the heavens and the earth and called everything good. Yes, Christ goes before us. And yes, Christ prepares a place for us. But Christ is also here. Christ is also now. And so today we may have a sharp answer to Jesus when he turns to us and asks us, does this offend you? Yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> Jesus had been talking about something specific when a large number of his followers decided, nope, they had heard enough, and they walked away. He wasn't, pre he wasn't presenting dense Trinitarian theology or commenting on the equality of women. He, but he was saying things that might be on my list or on your list or many other people's list of the 10 things we hate about Christianity. Jesus was talking about how if we eat his flesh and drink his blood, the bread that came down from heaven, we will live forever. Now maybe some people walked away simply because they were mystified. They just had no idea what Jesus meant. And it all seemed like a hopeless and deeply weird puzzle. And maybe others walked away because they understood clearly what he was saying, and they found it mortifying or disgusting or simply wrong. For us, this is a good moment to stop and wonder, 
to pause and ask ourselves what exactly we find most troubling about our faith, and then really consider whether we want to keep at it, to keep following Jesus, to keep gathering here week by week, and to be formed into disciples and sent forth from here as apostles, as those who proclaim the faith in our words and actions. This is the moment that Peter and the others are having here. Jesus is turning to them and he's being direct. Do you want this or not? Peter's answer is intriguing. It's not a simple, yes, Lord, the way so many prophets before him would respond to God with simple ferocity. They would say, here I am. Peter says in his own way that sure, he's in, but it's mostly because there's nowhere else to go. Peter says, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. But maybe we are different. Maybe we have plenty of other places to go. We could choose from any number of religions, or we could step away from religion entirely and seek ultimate meaning in other pursuits, like nature hikes or yoga. We could simply be good agnostics who seek the truth in our relationships or in our careers or in our identities as parents or neighbors or friends. God would meet us there. So why Christianity? Why Jesus? Why this complicated, sometimes exasperating life of faith? I'll give you my answer, and then I'll let you reflect on what yours might be. Christianity goes the distance. That's my answer. Jesus of Nazareth leads us into the very worst problems of life. We are called to reconcile with one another, with those we call our enemies, and this may be the hardest kind of reconciliation, with those we ourselves have harmed. We are called to give of ourselves, to give painfully in loving service to others. We are called to take seriously the most excruciating human problem, injustice, cruelty, systems of oppression, economies that help us while hurting and killing other people, deadly pathogens, ecocide, addiction, racism, sexism, transphobia, and that's not even the whole list. Jesus of Nazareth goes the distance, and as the body of Christ, we participate in his work. Jesus ate with sinners, which sounds gentle and lightly provocative, but in his day, it was the kind of thing that Sister Helen Prejean does in our time. She goes to death row, and she finds the humanity in people who have committed atrocious crimes. Jesus cleansed the temple, which sounds quaint and lightly theatrical. But in his day, it was the kind of thing that St. Francis did in the Middle Ages when he stripped naked in the town square, and he told his wealthy textile merchant father that his father wasn't his father anymore, and Francis wanted nothing to do with the trappings of money and power. Jesus stretched out his hands to touch sick people and outcasts, which sounds loving and lightly pastoral. But in his day, it was the kind of thing that a Seattleite of our time, a gruff old man named Dutch, spent his whole sober life doing for decades when he walked along the gutters of Pioneer Square and he pulled alcoholics up on their feet and he put them in his truck and he took them to AA meetings. Christianity goes the distance. That's my answer. Now, I readily confess that I often fail to go the distance. I am often slow to reconcile, even though reconciliation is my life's work. I am often resistant to let go of my valuables and creature comforts, even though I truly want to learn the hard lessons of Francis. Or at least I think I do. Or at least I say I do. I imagine Sister Helen and Dutch will always shine more brightly than me in the communion of saints, arrayed gloriously around God's throne. But that just brings me to my second favorite thing about Christianity, the thing that keeps me coming back even when it is odd and offensive. Christianity goes the distance, yes, but it also offers forgiveness, and it authentically welcomes everyone, even and especially those of us who keep falling short. 
There is nothing I can do that will separate me from God's love and Christ's invitation. God will never, ever give up on me or you. So maybe that's what Peter meant when he said that Jesus offered the only way for Peter to follow. The way of Christ demands everything from us, but it also never gives up on us. What could be better than that? On the other side of all that, with all of its messy conflict and human absurdity and searing heartbreak, on the other side of all that is the weight of glory, all that is good, a feast of unending life for everybody. Does this offend you? Yeah, it offends me too. But what could possibly be better than this? Together, let us affirm our faith. We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, of water and earth, of all humanity. We believe in God beside us, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, born of a woman's womb, servant of the poor. He was tortured and nailed to a tree, Knowing Knowing full passion passion and deep deep sorrow, sorrow, he died died forsaken. forsaken. He descended descended into the the earth, to the place of death. death. On the third third day, he rose from the tomb. tomb. He ascended into heaven heaven to be everywhere everywhere present, present. and And his his kingdom kingdom will one day be known. We believe in God within us, us. the Holy Holy Spirit Spirit of Pentecostal Pentecostal fire, fire. life-giving breath of the church. She is the spirit of healing and forgiveness, source of resurrection and of life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for all people of faith. We pray especially for all ministers at Grace Church during this time of transition. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Let us pray for all the people of the world. We pray especially for those who are facing the effects of climate change and for all who are working to restore God's good creation. Hear us, O God. For your mercy is great. Let us pray for all who hunger, all who are lonely, 
all who are anxious or depressed, and all in need of guidance, strength, and comfort. We pray especially for those on our prayer list. We pray for healing for Mike, Pete, Christy, Aunt Barbara, Mary Ann, Elizabeth, Nicole and baby Miles, Dick, Howard, Ron, David, Mark, George, Claire and baby, Charles, Eli, Ted, Stacy, Glenna, Alice, Dave, Susan, Nell, Baby Lennon, Beverly, Mary Ann, Garth, Brian, Marguerite M, Carson, Julie, Doug, Jenny, Mike, Barbara, Rich, Claire, Lynn, Susie, Ken, and Dina. We pray for support for Fran, Erica, Alyssa, and David's family and friends. William, Lynn, Becky, Robert and AJ, Kathy, Jim, Luke, and Mark, Mary, and the Kuntz family, Lee, Stuart, Papa Joe, and Mary, Justin, Nicole, and Sue, Colleen, Maddie, and Nina, Susan, David, Anne, Mark, and Graham, Mackenzie, Ken and Susan, Flory, Chuck, Brittany and Evan, Ron, Martha, Peggy and Nancy, Gary, Alyssa and Ashley, Tracy, Rhonda, Cheryl and Poppy, Robin, Beth, Marge, Paul, Dave, Steve and Debbie, Steph, and all those threatened and impacted by wildfires in California and elsewhere. We ask for prayers of peace for Bob, Judy, and Sharon. We remember David. We give thanks for the life of Fern and Mark. Hear us, O God. Amen. Your mercy is great. Let us pray in thanksgiving for those who have died and for those who mourn. Hear us, O God. For your mercy is great.
The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
Blessed are you, O God, sovereign of the universe. You open wide your hand and give food to every living creature. You created the heavens and the earth and fed the human ones with fruit from the garden. You restored the earth after the flood. You gave your servants Abraham and Sarah food for their guests. You nourished Jacob and his family in a time of famine. You led your people into freedom and fed them in the wilderness. You fill the widow's larder with oil. You gather an abundant harvest of righteousness. You give us bread to eat, and so we live. Your spirit overshadowed your servant Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, your son, the bread of life. He fed the multitude with barley loaves, the bread of the poor. He reconciled his friends to himself at breakfast by the sea. He offered his own body as food for the life of the world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. We proclaim the mystery of faith. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restore our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. O God, you are wheat of abundance. Nourish us with your life. O God, you are salt of the earth. Send us into your field of mission. O oh God, you are oil of gladness. Pour over us the joy of reconciliation. O oh God, you are milk and honey. Return all people to their home in you. Accept, O oh Lord, our sacrifice of praise, this memorial of our redemption. Send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts. Let them be for us the body and blood of your Son, and grant that we who eat this bread and drink this cup may be filled with your life and goodness. Leaven this gathered community with your Holy Spirit, that we with your whole creation might be renewed and find a place at your abundant table where Lazarus is poor no longer. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the true bread which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life life and and cup cup of salvation. salvation. You have have united united us us with Christ Christ and one another, another. and you you have have made made us us one one with all all your people people in heaven heaven and on earth. earth. Now Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that that we may may proclaim your redeeming love to the world world, and continue forever in the risen life of Christ, Christ our Savior. Savior. Amen. Amen. This time I invite you to come forward if you'd like to celebrate with us a birthday or anniversary. I'm looking at one couple that I think really should come forward. (laughs) What are we celebrating? Wonderful. Seventeenth anniversary, I think. That old, huh? <laughs> Seventy years old. Just getting started. Ninety-six. Let us pray. Most holy God, you are the conqueror of time. You are with us in all of the times and places of our lives. We ask your blessing upon these, your servants, as they celebrate another year and another year together, a year of health and wholeness. Send them from here with your spirit and your gladness. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, God bless Erica and Raul. <laughs> Trust your life to the Lord of open spaces and the time of adventure, to the life that pulses through rain-drenched streets and mountain heights, to the love that sustains us through feasts and famine. Let God's hope be a clearing sky before you, a compass in your heart, guiding you to where you belong. And the blessing of the God, the one, holy and undivided Trinity, be among you now and remain with you always. Amen.
Please be seated for just a moment. I'm going to ask Eric to make a quick announcement. Can you tell me they hired somebody already? We're doing our annual carpet cleaning. Please, uh, if you would, able-bodied adults, as you finish the service. As we uh, finish the service today, please, for able-bodied adults who can lift chairs, please lift them and stack them five high on the cement toward the back of the sanctuary. Um, and I have, uh, I, I'm also seeking two helpers to help me clear the front offices over here. If you'd see me after the service, I'd like two adults that are capable. And then uh, if the music circle team would clear the, clear the music room of their items, or I'll do it later. Thank you very much. That's what I needed to get done before the service finishes. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Heather Parr. I'm one of your outreach co-leaders. And today we are bringing back our service Sundays, which will happen on the fourth Sunday of every month. Um, where, so today we're working on a project to organize some donations uh, that will go to Faith Episcopal in Polsbo. They have showers that are now open for our neighbors who are living on the streets. And in partnership with Fishline, there's going to have an opportunity for showers and some uh, clean socks and clothing and other items. So if you're able to stay for 15 to 20 minutes and help us with sorting through and organizing those donations, we'll be under the eaves um, right outside the door near the kitchen there. What are we supposed to be doing? We just had one more little thing. Hi there, uh, I'm Daphne and this is Luke and we are your wardens. Uh, we want to talk to you about a letter we're going to be sending to you that has something to do with our transition. For many of us, this past year has been a time of loss. We've said goodbye to some familiar faces. And we've sent our beloved priest to a new church elsewhere. It would be easy to feel discouraged when we once again put up our masks but we do it because we love and want to protect each other, it is inevitable that these losses would sometimes weigh the spirit down. We wonder, what's next? We are talking to you today to look at the gifts of this time, not the silver linings, but the golden light of good that warms us. We noted, as Wren left us, that the gift of her time here was to leave grace changed changed for good. We discovered that the simple act of seeing and being with each other, praying together for our friends, families, and the world on screen or for real, has sparked joy right into the center of our hearts. Last summer, on a cloudy day, we welcomed our Stephen with flowers, balloons, gifts, and a car parade at a distance with our customary grace, graciousness. And he has been a gift, brought to us through a legacy gift from a parishioner and the support of the diocese. Anyone who's watched Stephen lead us for the last weeks and heard him speak understands that he has deep skill and experience for nearly 10 years, he served as an ordained deacon in Washington in Virginia churches. During his academic time, leading to ordination as a priest, Stephen briefly became deacon in charge, basically the de facto priest role for a parish in Virginia. He also has significant experience in the keyboard and choral music. He worked for nearly 20 years as a psychotherapist. He's an organizational development specialist and a trainer working with the Diocese of Olympia with the Congregation for, Col for the College for Congregational Development and uh, also with the Congregational Consultant Network. So of course, there's lots more to learn about Stephen um, and we're here to celebrate the gift of more time with his gifts. Last Wednesday, the vestry had a discernment conversation with Stephen about being our interim rector. A while ago, after he and his husband, Andrew Stone, <laughs> had thoroughly considered whether Stephen might be willing to be our priest, 
Stephen said jokingly to me that he felt like a guy waiting to be asked to the prom. <laughs> he thought he'd say yes. So we asked Stephen, the vestry did, to be our interim rector, and thanks be to God, he did say yes. Um, I, I, I'm so thrilled to, for you to make that good welcome with Stephen. Uh, he will be our interim rector starting September the 1st, and just so you think he's not uh, just goofing off, he is going to take a break uh, next Sunday, um, and so our curate will be taking a break, and then when he comes back, he'll be our interim rector. It'll just be a short <laughs> break, and uh, so we're totally thrilled, and thank you, Stephen, for saying yes. Thank you. Yes. It's